Yeah. Thank, oh, thanks very much. Thanks, Andre. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, when uh, Josh rang me and said, oh, would you mind um, thinking about, you know, filling in for this lecture? I did think, um, well, my name's not Brian and that doesn't begin with B. So do I have to change it? But no, Josh was uh, clear that I didn't. So I was able to take on the gig. But it, um, uh, it is an honour and a privilege to be asked to deliver the Brian Nettleton Lecture, to remember Brian and to have an opportunity to address such an important audience. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this unceded land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, their elders past, present and emerging, and any First Nations people here today. Now, this acknowledgement is particularly important for us, outdoor educators, because we live and work, as we have just acknowledged, on unceded lands, owned by First Nations peoples, their elders and communities. So what does such an acknowledgement actually mean for us and our work? How do we reflect this acknowledgement in our units and programs in our teaching? So I've got three points up here. I'll go through each one. So point one, who was Brian? I had the privilege of knowing Brian. He was a lecturer at Melbourne University. He was one of my PhD supervisors, as Andrew mentioned. He was caring and humble, shy, many people would say, while being a leader in our field. And he was focused on relationships and very much on relationships with place. For him, nature was a friend, and he wrote about this. Specifically, it was the Yarra River in Warrandyte, close to his house in East Ringwood, Wurundjeri country, which was most familiar, where he felt most at home with his family, far from where he was born in Yorkshire, England. Brian was not Indigenous, and neither am I, along with most of us here. I was born in Malaysia, actually, my father's family being of Chinese background and my mother's of Irish background generations ago. Why is this important? Because family history is important. Family is history. And this will be one of the main points I emphasised this morning. History is not just an abstract academic subject. History is also about family. I think Layla Gudawiwi made this clear in her keynote presentation yesterday when she shared some of her intimate family stories and pictures, making the point that these family stories speak of and to country culture and place, they can't be separated. Point two, how do we embrace Indigenous history in our programs, history that intersects with non-Indigenous history? We are implicated. My experience is that we tend to emphasise knowledge because knowledge is fact and difficult to question. We speak about human nature relationships, but with an emphasis on nature and looking after the land. Ind Indigenous knowledges are very important here. But sometimes this knowledge is taught as if the past 200 years of history never happened. We teach facts about how things were before Indigenous and non-Indigenous histories became entwined. So how can we embrace the history of the, the last 200 years in our programs? This will be another main point I aim to emphasise this morning. Point three. So to emphasise both of the first two points, I'm suggesting that we need to learn to understand the local histories of the places we go for our outdoor education programs. Not just the environmental histories, but the human histories as well. Human nature relationships involve humans as well as nature. This requires acknowledging, which we now do, and further investigating, further understanding the history over the last 200 years in these places. Early encounters between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in these places have laid the groundwork for Indigenous and non-Indigenous perspectives today. So what happened and what does this mean for our understanding of Indigenous perspectives? Remembering that this is local history and local history is family history. I draw attention to this quote from Brian Nettleton because it speaks to education and history being not just thought, but felt. Uh, this is important when family are involved, when relationships are involved, perspectives are felt, they are emotive and not just facts. Uh, and I noticed that th this article was published in the first ever issue of the Australian Journal of Outdoor Education, which is now uh, Journal of Outdoor Environmental Education. 
my eyes were open through two significant events that happened where I work. One was teaching in a new subject last year in the initial teacher education degree, a subject called First Nations in education. The, su the subject is compulsory and in the first semester of the course, class groups in this subject are in the first semester of this course, full stop. Class groups in this subject <laughs> are made up from across early childhood, primary and secondary. So the focus is broad, which can counter the excuse sometimes offered of, well, I teach X subject, so this has nothing to do with me. One challenge being met by this subject in the net is the need to address ATSL accreditation standards 1.4 and 2.4 for initial teacher education degrees, which I've just put up there. The message here is that all teachers must be able to teach in this area and taking on that responsibility is key to our shared future. Many non-Indigenous teachers feel out of their depth in these teaching areas, but my Indigenous colleagues are adamant that non-Indigenous teachers, like me, need to take this on seriously in order to help us all move forward. There just aren't enough Indigenous people to do all the work. Key to this university subject are the three concepts around the outside of Melita's diagram. Melita's um, our Associate Professor of Indigenous Education. Place responsive, strength-based truth-telling. Most of us will be familiar with the first two, but the third not so much, and yet all three are necessary. But this is not simple and easy. When we offered this subject for the first time last year, there was a pre-service teacher who was very vocal in opposition, not to mention concerns about social media trolling and other mainstream media commentators. The second significant event happened through a seminar we organized around the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And it is important to say the full name, including from the heart, because this is a statement to be felt, not just to be thought about, which is why it is framed by signatures and an artwork. How many national statements do you see presented in this way? Part of the seminar was a large group discussion at which there were a small number of Indigenous colleagues from the education faculty at Melbourne Uni and other universities, some from interstate. After a number of people had aired their views, an Indigenous colleague sitting beside me raised her hand and in a manner that revealed how deeply she felt this said, all we want you to do is feel our pain. Sorry. Uh, I'll say that again. All we want you to do is feel our pain. Uh, that moment will stay with, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. That moment will stay with me forever. Uh, it's not just a thought, but, <clears throat> but more importantly, a feeling. It is the feeling in this moment uh, that I return to when I'm trying to ground sorry, my understanding of Indigenous perspectives. Perspective is more than knowledge. But what does this mean exactly? To explore this further, I shall turn to events in Gunai Kurnai country in Gippsland, because we need to get more local. I need to acknowledge Bo Miles here, who many of you will know or know of. Bo was born and raised in Gippsland, and he still lives in Gippsland. He and I worked together for a year at a school in Gippsland, teaching outdoor education. He also worked at Monash University with Brian Watchow and many others and has now gone on to bigger and better things, which I'm sure Brian would agree with. A few years ago, I was present at an Outward Bound dinner in Buchan, where Bo was the guest speaker, and he shared with us a story about a run he had done and filmed with his crew of the Macmillan track. The Macmillan walking track is a long one. This map highlights some of the places it traverses, including major river valleys that many of us will be familiar with. The work done over the course of 1864 to make it is remarkable. As bushwalking publishers, John and Monica Chapman put it, in 1864, Angus Macmillan led an expedition to cut a track through the high country of Victoria to link the gold fields together. It took about one year to cut an eight foot wide track that was suitable for pack horses. This was used for many years, but as the gold fields declined and modern roads replaced the need for a pack horse trail, the track fell into obscurity and vanished under the scrub. The track was revived by the Ben Crocken Walking Club during the 1980s. 
So here's a trailer for the movie Bo and his crew filmed of his running, running of the Macmillan track, which I'll play. Well, you can choose to be emotional about this sort of stuff or not, and I think I'm choosing to be emotional about it. I think I'm taking this personally now, and it's taken me 20 years to do so. I didn't as a kid because I was taught a different kind of history. So I'm going to go and run across the mountains in this place that I now call home. I'm a Gippslander. The very place that a Scottish bloke came over the mountains and, and put on the map, at least for the Europeans. But of course, the Aboriginal people have been here for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden he takes ownership of it. I really want to feel these sort of lands that Macmillan went across all those years ago. Because whether I like it or not, Macmillan has shaped my history and, and the history of Gippsland. But it wasn't without a cost. A whole lot of bloodshed happened. That wasn't taught in school. Okay, so Bo's still putting that film together with Jody and Mitch and others in his team. And I think it's meant to come out at uh, the end of the year or something. I think Jody was saying. Anyway, so look forward to that. Oh, sorry. How did you go? Well, you can choose to be a mug. Oh, here we go. Done. We're done. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Sorry about that. So in preparing for this run, Bo read a book by Cal Flynn called Thicker Than Water, and I highly recommend it as a, a very interesting read. Cal is Scottish and an investigative journalist, and she travelled to Victoria to write a book about her famous great-great-great-uncle, Angus Macmillan, who some still refer to as the father of Gippsland. Angus Macmillan came to Australia during the diaspora impacted by the Highland clearances in Scotland. Life in Scotland at the time was very challenging. This was happening to families. But what this made me aware of was that for the Gunai Kurnai people, it was their great, great, great uncles and aunties, great, great, great grandmothers and grandfathers, and more besides, who encountered Scottish people arriving in Australia. And during the wars that ensued in Gippsland, many, many were massacred. These events are not just history, they are family. The whole idea of histories and perspectives is much closer than many of us realise or recognise. So when Cal got here and started digging, she uncovered more about her famous relative than she initially bargained for. Earlier this year, Lauren uh, and I spent a bit of time with her Miller relatives in the Orkney Islands in Scotland. On one outing, we visited a farm museum, which was really just a, an old farmhouse. It wasn't a full on museum or anything and spoke with the staff member there about life in the area in the 1800s, 1800s. He shared some interesting facts, though it is difficult to understand his accent. I'll just play. <laughs> My gosh, yes, yeah. Oh, well, uh, there's certainly a um, lot of folk get up there, right on off, and they that long. A big ordeal in that day, see, oh, it a it long journey. It, it must have been a long sail yeah. to get there. Terrible oh, journey. must have been yeah, horrifying, wasn't it? Terrible yeah. day, months of travelling. And we had relatives, they were, um, well, the lady would have been a flat and her husband was grieved in him. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they landed out there and the, wherever that they landed, I think it was New South Wales, it took them three months to get to the piece where they were going to be staying. Right. And they flit with an ox and a cart. Yeah. And maybe three or four bairns on the cart and another one Jesus. expected. Oh, <laughs> oh, what they managed, we don't I know. know. Mm. So, so again, this is about history, it is about family. The picture to the right was taken when we were informed by Lauren's cousin that this area in the Orkneys was one of those that experienced the clearances. Uh, and Angus Macmillan was from the Isle of Skye, I think. Okay. My God. Oh, here we go. Here we go, Damn, we got it. <laughs> 
Okay, this photo on the right is one bow took of a can memorialising Angus Macmillan, and there are many of these uh, through Gippsland. But also, as Bo mentioned, there are many places in Gippsland that bear local names reflecting horrific events which happened there. This map on the left is of massacre sites constructed by researchers from the University of Newcastle. And the book cover in the middle um, is one by Peter Gardner, and he has conducted extensive research of historical documents in Gippsland in making a case for his arguments. Cal Flynn also researched extensively and reached a similar conclusion. However, for her, Angus Macmillan was not the father of Gippsland, but her great, great, great uncle. This was about family. At the beginning of this presentation, I emphasised two main points. The first was family, the second was history, and if there is a third, it is the connection between them. How do we bring these to bear in our work in outdoor education? I think that to do this, we must reflect more intently on the acknowledgement of country, which is a job, a task for non-Indigenous people. It is not Indigenous people who have to do this work because it is very easy to pay lip service to it and perceive it as tokenistic when it is not. Acknowledgement is a very important part of the process of reconciliation. Without it, it is difficult to move forward, and we are experiencing this with discussions of a voice to parliament and treaty. Recalling Melita's conceptual diagram of the First Nations in education subject, she highlighted three main concepts, place responsive, strength-based, truth-telling. These three together call for actions that we need to undertake as non-Indigenous teachers in order to truly acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands in which we work and live. Knowing these places is not just a matter of ecosystems, of science, of geography, it is a matter of history, of local history, of family. When we collaborate with local landowners for access to land, we often think of farmers and growers living there now. The relationships we forge with these landowners can be close and long-term as they should be. These relationships are personal. 30 years ago, when working with uh, OEG, working at OEG, I helped manage our programs in the McAllister River area. In setting up some new rafting and walking routes, I spent a lot of time visiting with local farmers. I vividly recall having lunch in a dark and cool farmhouse with old Ron Sweetapple, who made me one of the most tender steaks I've ever had from his own hung meat, and spending numerous hours with his neighbours, whose names escape me, but I do remember having to access a certain place unexpectedly and being met by one of these neighbours brandishing a shotgun. When he saw it was me, we had a friendly chat. Another landowner told us about a gate that needed replacing in a fence line high on a ridge on his property. We bought a new gate and with a few others from OEG, we carried it all the way up onto that ridge and replaced the damaged gate. But I didn't contact the local indigenous landowners. When we collaborate with Indigenous landowners regarding land, we need to expend similar efforts and we should aim for the long term. This is about forging relationships, learning histories, understanding perspectives, but this takes time. We do not gain access to families and their histories, their perspectives by simply making a phone call. It requires being responsive to place, to building strengths-based relationships and to recognising and acknowledging injustices through, through truth-telling. These involve feeling as well as thinking. And this requires motivated research, searching, reading, talking, learning. Do your own informed learning, Leila Guruiwi said yesterday. Cal Flynn came here all the way from Scotland uh, and did just that. Through such endeavour, our understanding of where we are and who we are shifts significantly. And this trans transformation can impact our program design and thus our teaching. Exactly how to do this is up to each of us and those we work with. 30 years ago, Brian Nettleton was pushing the boundaries of how we think about relationships in outdoor education by speaking of friendship, friendships between humans and nature, but also how these friendships reflect relationships we have with one another, family and friends. Caring for the land is not something we do outside of caring for people. There's a lot of work to do in truly acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, their elders past, present and emerging, but I know we have the will and many of us have begun taking on the work required. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>